I don't know who had more fun. I mean, I'm looking at the celebration behind there, trying to not crack up. We're cracking up over there. So it's an entertaining moment. Oh, so this is the end of our series. We've been talking about animals. We've been talking about the inspiration that we can get from our animals and their wisdom. What have we learned so far? We learned that our own fur babies can give us tips on how to go about self-care. And we recognize that even with all of the distractions in the world and feeling that kind of level of intensity, that this is the time now to really shore up our self-care practices. We know that when we are in that place, that allows us to act and respond from our highest self. We also realize that animals have souls and they often operate from the framework, that spiritual principle of oneness. And it called us to really look at how are we being one in the world. So today we're gonna to talk about unconditional love from the wisdom of man's best friend, dogs. Now, if you don't have the affinity for dogs, that's okay. I want you to think of what animal gave you unconditional love. So every time I talk about my fur babies, you just imagine that animal that you received unconditional love from. Last time, I shared with you that I've had an affinity for animals pre-verbal and I started in seminary, I gave you a little snapshot of seminary. Today, we're going back to the 90s. The 90s, you remember the 90s. It was only 10 years ago. <laughs> I, like, I realized it was oh, 30 years ago. Oh, 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 when did that happen? And I, with my passion, I decided I got an opportunity to be a animal shelter director in New York City for the ASPCA. So this is a picture of me and my fur babies at the time that Shakespeare and the littler one is um, Sadie Mae. And um, you know, it was big hair back then, so yeah. <laughs> big hair. Um, I was really excited to get this job. I was going to like make a difference in animals' lives. I was gonna save them. And then I came to the realization that because of humanity's disconnection from source, disconnection from nature, disconnection from their divinity, they were unable to see these animals as sentient beings. So the shelter became the dropping off place the place where abused animals would come, the place where animals that didn't match their color scheme because they redecorated, I swear that's a true story, brought their animal in. And therefore, we could not keep up with the pace of all the animals that were coming into us. So what I had hoped to be this life-saving moment for all these animals turned into a nightmare for me. So I wanted to save them. I worked with no-kill shelters as much as possible, coming in, taking animals out. I worked with rescue groups. You know, there are certain groups that will deal with certain breeds, and they would come in and they would take them out. Anything that I could do to give them a chance to have their forever home. There were animals that sometimes got sick there. They would get kennel cough or they would get respiratory infections. But I knew that they were the kind of breed that people were looking to adopt. So I would bring those sick animals home to my house, you know, give them medicine to get them better. Of course, my guys would get sick in the process, so I'm like double duty just to save these babies. During my tenure in New York City, the New York animal shelters, 60,000 animals dead each year. I looked at the website of ASPCA today to look at those current numbers. 
920,000 animals in the United States are put to sleep every year, every year. And as I was working on this job, I started to have severe anxiety and panic attacks, right? This was also the time, remember I said it was the 90s? This was the height of the pit bull fight clubs. So these animals would come in so damaged, so traumatized, there was no chance of rehabilitating them. I lasted two years in that capacity. And around my second year, I started to have this reoccurring nightmare. I would be dead, and I would go to the pearly gates to get into heaven. And I'm waiting. And all of a sudden, every animal that I signed off on to be put down was at the gate. And they wouldn't let me in because I was responsible for their death. You see, every animal that is euthanized has to have the shelter director's approval on. So every morning, I would go in with these fur babies in these cages past the point because we, there aren't enough people for these animals, and I would have to sign their card that they need to be PTS, put to sleep. And I would stay in front of each one, and I would just bless them and I would pray with them, and I would say, it's for you're free to be at peace now, for each and every animal I signed off on. And that nightmare that I was having, it, it started getting more and more frequent, and I realized I have to leave. This is not something that I can continue on. And at that time, there was a position that came available that I could be a director of several adoption centers. And I took that because now I felt like, okay, I'm on the other side of this. I'm only finding homes for these fur babies. So it was really a very stressful situation for me to be in. And I just am so grateful that dogs don't really think or act the way that we do. They're so much nicer than we are, so much their unconditional love is truly unconditional. They just love. And I found this cartoon, and I think it really sums it up nicely. You know, at the pearly gates. Remember all those times that you left me home? What would humans do? Humans would be like, hasta la vista, baby, right? And the dog is like, now we can play all the time. It truly took a long time for me to work through this process, both emotionally and spiritually, to release the belief that I had come to think was me. I'm a horrible person. I was filled with guilt and shame about what my job function was, what I did to survive. And then I came to this realization, and I want you to really listen to this. If I believe that my past action defined who I am and what I deserve, then there would be no grace. There would be no ability to create anew. There would be no way for me to be present and experience the unconditional love of my fur babies. With me? You see, understanding grace is really important in this moment. Grace in Christian theology is the spontaneous, unmerited gift of divine favor and the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. Let's look at this from a different perspective, from the metaphysics that we believe here in unity. Fillmore says this in his book, Keep a True Lent. The grace of God is greater than the laws of man, that even beyond what we ask, seek, earn, or deserve under the law, God is more than willing to give. 
by becoming receptive to the grace of God, we receive the measure of God's provision which exceeds any of our imaginations. Any of our imaginations. You see, grace reminds us that God isn't judging us. God isn't judging us based on our human understanding or beliefs. Grace is an unearned blessing that we use to regenerate, to create anew. It's immeasurable and it's not based on merit. It's based on unconditional love. And each of us is entitled to grace simply because we are part of the divine. It's our birthright. These are my kids today. That's Gracie and Ziggy. And that's probably a year after we adopted them, so that's probably 2011 that we have them. And I have to tell you that I am blessed by them. They remind me of grace regularly in my life. Each day I am in awe that these dogs think I'm wonderful. They think I'm actually fabulous, <laughs> right? They greet me in the morning simply because I'm breathing. And it's like, you're breathing, you're fabulous. <laughs> Just for that. Each time I come home in the evening, it doesn't matter what kind of day I've had. It's like there's my cheerleading group. <gasps> give me an M, give me an O, give me an M. Mom's home, right? That's just an amazing feeling of unconditional love that we get from them. So what do they do? What's the lesson that I learn? That I'm divinity in skin simply because I exist. And simply because I exist, I am worthy of love. I am worthy of being celebrated. You're breathing, you're working, you're here today. Celebrate, right? It's been such a huge blessing for me that it's really helped me look at my relationship to the divine. It's given me an insight into how I define God based on my own indoctrination and my erroneous beliefs. Also, it challenged me to question, are my beliefs true? What I believe, what I learned in Catholicism, is that true? Is that true? Does God really only love me based on what I do and the, the tenets that I practice? Or is God simply unconditional love. And I think that that is how God sees us. God sees us unconditionally loved just because we are an aspect of the divine. So there's no judgment from God if we make mistakes or failures. Let me say that again. There is no God. <laughs> Take two. There is no judgment from God for our mistakes or failures. God simply loves us because we exist. And that's a really powerful lesson for all of us. Because first, for me personally, it allows me to love myself when I fall short. And then it allows me to love others when inevitably they do because they're human. The other piece that I got from this is God wants us to be in the present moment. And we humans are so often in the past. We are so often in the past. We're living in the past. We're remembering the past. What happened, what they said, all in the past. But when we are in the past, we miss, we miss experiencing the amazing things that are happening now. The love that is here for us now. So I want you to think of this and hold this. If you're focused on the past, you are dying in the present. If you're focused on the past, you are dying in the present. And so I just kind of want to 
step aside with what's going on in our country today, right now. I received a couple of connections of women just really hurting by what's going on regarding our bodies. And before you send the email to the board saying I'm political, I want you to know that I'm not coming from a place of politics. We are not this bubble that only light things can happen within this bubble. We are building up skills. We are building up resilience. We are being clear in who we are and the purpose that we are here on planet Earth to make a difference outside of these walls. So if something is happening outside of these walls, my job as a spiritual leader, as a spiritual teacher, is to talk about that, to talk about it, and to then say, how do we make sense with this? What's ours to do? So I'm not going to shy away from those things. But I'm going to talk about abortion from the perspective of how it's impacted us women. As this is now in the news, many women are now looking at their own moments of abortions that they've had. We have been indoctrinated really hard in this society that we are wrong, that we are sinners, that we are going to hell because we terminated a pregnancy. And as these feelings are coming up, I'm inviting you to look at it. Because unless we've dealt with what that was in the past, that means it is still chuntering in the background, driving us, driving us, driving us. So I'm saying to you now, let's unpack it. Whatever the reason is that the pregnancy was terminated, whether it was financially you knew you couldn't afford to take care of this child, whether it was for health reasons, whether it was you didn't want to be a single mother and you knew you'd go it alone, whatever the reason is, I'm inviting you to stop punishing yourself. I'm inviting you to give up the guilt, the shame, the unworthiness. And how do I know that women still have that is because we behave according to how we think of ourselves. How many women put ourselves in situations that are untenable, intolerable, because we don't feel worthy enough. It drives us unconsciously. We have been told we are wrong, we are bad, should we terminate a pregnancy. And I want to say this, if I may be so bold to speak on God's behalf. God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. And if you're a guy and you were in that place in your life that you just couldn't handle the responsibility or the decisions of having a child and that's the choice that you got to with your partner, God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. God loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. How much of us is holding on to the past? When life was kinder, when life was gentler, when I was younger, when I was prettier, right? When the world seemed to make sense and we knew our place in the world. Because if you are, if you're holding on to the past, then you are missing out on the now moment. You're missing out on being loved by those around you. You're missing out on creating a new. 
You're missing out on discovering all the wondrous things that are here simply because you are a part of God. And then what about us as a spiritual community? Are we holding on to the past? Are we living in the past? Are we hoping to recreate what worked then, now? Because if we are, we will not thrive. We will not survive the church of the future. Martha Creek, how many of you remember Martha Creek? Martha Creek was here for my installation and she spoke this last week at the Unity Worldwide Convention. So we have it annually, all the ministers get to get the, and we kind of go there. I did it virtually this year because I really wanted um, the minister support team to, to be able to witness what some of these conversations were that were happening there. And Martha spoke about the future of ministry. And she was adamant that churches who will thrive are the ones who are constantly innovating, constantly innovating. She said, church life is now engaged in a new level of unpredictability and we must be agile. We must stop trying to create what worked in the past because it will not work now. I'm frequently bombarded by church members and attendees of what the past successes were. But that's not what we need to thrive. One of the things Martha mentioned is to stop working on vision, mission, and strategy. You see, in the past, we have been trained that if we want to change something within the church or we want to improve something, that we go to mission and vision and do that work. But Martha suggests instead to evangelize. Yep, I felt the same way. And then I did my work on it. You see, we go to these conventions so that we get these, ah, so then we can do some of our own work and get a, oh yeah, I could see that. So evangelism means to convert someone to Christianity or to preach the Christian gospel. And I don't know about you, but I've got a few of those memories, Jehovah Witness knocking on the door, or another mission sect coming in and saying, you have to come to our church, we want to save your soul, right? Because obviously I'm a sinner, and therefore the only way that I can get into heaven is by saying, Jesus has saved me, right? Oh, and then when I acknowledge Jesus saved me, then I've got to adhere to all of these tenets. You know, like who to love, like don't do sex unless you're procreating. <laughs> you know, all those things that didn't make sense to me. So I'm inviting you to see it in a different way. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it's life. Right? Sex is life. Abortion is part of life. Divorce is part of life. Death is part of life. There is nothing that we cannot talk about. We have to talk about it. We have to know how do we deal with these from a spiritual perspective. Okay. What if? we create unity evangelism. What? <laughs> unity evangelism. So what if our mission is just to remind people of their power and divinity? Can you get behind that? I've been asking that since the time I got here to Unity Church of the Hills, right? I've been saying to you, remember your truth. Remember, you're a divine human and remind other people in your lives that they are divine human as well. I've asked you to check in online so that you can tell people where you're going to remember your truth and where you're going to be inspired, right? I've asked you to invite people here so that they too can awaken and know their soul's purpose. All of those things are evangelism, all of them. 
But here's the thing, this isn't about growing our church. That's not our purpose. It's not about growing the church. It's about growing oneness in the world. That's what it's about. So our purpose is about giving people the opportunity to realize that they are co-creators with God, that they are divinity in skin, that they are here to love and be love in the world. What I'm calling for is an accelerated shift in consciousness in our communities. Now, in the past, Unity used the tagline, the best kept secret. Well, we've done a really good job of that, haven't we? Yeah, we've done a, such a good job that our movement is dying. Our movement is dying. So I'm inviting you to stop looking backwards and be present here in this moment because we are creating some amazing things together. In Paul Selig's book, The Kingdom, the ascended teachers teach us this. But you don't understand that everything changes as it is renowned or renamed. So they're talking about that claim, behold, all things, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. And you know, when we start feeling like, oh yeah, I've got the Christ consciousness, oh yeah, that's it. Then, then we think, well, where is the water for me to walk on? Where is the water for me to turn to wine, right? And they're saying all those things are true ideas. They are illustrations of what can be known through a level of mastery. When an individual becomes Christ's mind and therefore creator fully in expression, we wish you to understand the principle and the invocation of the claim, behold, I make all things new. It's beyond the small self's ideas of parading ability or showing others what the divine self can do. You see, the divine self doesn't need the accolades and appreciation of others because there is a knowing. We are becoming what we were always meant to be, God in skin, God in skin. As we rejuvenate in our mind, our body, and our soul, we become a greater realization of truth. As we commit to doing our spiritual and shadow work, our light becomes brighter. And when our light becomes brighter, what do you think happens? People are attracted to that light. They wanna know, oh, what are you doing? Oh, what's going on? You're always glowing, you're always smiling. What's going on there, right? There's, there's an attraction, this frequency is so wondrous that we attract these people to us. People who are ready to have those conversations about truth ready to sparkle, ready to play, ready to engage. So I'm inviting you to stop looking back. Stop looking at those people who may have left this community. They left because they're simply not in resonance. They aren't right or wrong, we aren't right or wrong, you aren't right or wrong. They are just on another path, another spiritual path. And what I'm inviting you to do is to start engaging with those who are interested in evolving consciousness, who have the frequencies that are in resonance with what we are becoming as a community. And I often hear unitics, which are you guys, <laughs> say, yeah, but you know, I don't really know what to say to people. Yeah, you know, that's kind of not me. I don't like to talk about my spirituality and what I'm doing. If you want to change the planet, my friends, you need to start talking about it. You need to start engaging with people about it. So unity evangelism, what are we calling that? Reminding people of their power and their divinity. Reminding people of their power and divinity. So I've given you some tips. First of all, who do you engage with? Not the person that's spewing hatred all over you. Not our family member that we think, you know, this would be really good if they got this. No! <laughs> no, that's not who we're engaging with. We are engaging with people who are passionate about making the world a better place, right? Maybe they're volunteering at different places, soup kitchens. Maybe they're doing pantries. Maybe they're out 
building something for Habitat for Humanity. We're looking for people who are questioning the status quo and the accepted norms, and they're ready to shift their awareness. We're talking to people who are sick and tired of being sick and tired and in need of a new way of being. So then we can ask questions, simply engage, have some questions. You know, are you living your best life? Do you know what your purpose is? Are you living your purpose? Are you happy in your life? All of those types of questions that are there. And here's a good one. What do you believe religion got wrong? Well, that'll start a huge conversation, I'm sure. Right? And listen. Listen to them. Hear them. Hear what is the need that they have. And what is that need that we can give to them, that we can match their need, right? And then share around something that you've similarly shifted in. You can also just share what our principles are, right? We believe in no dogma. Everyone's included, no exceptions. We believe in oneness, that there's only one power, one presence in the universe, right? We believe we are co-creators. People are hungry for this stuff, my friends. They're hungry for this knowledge. They're hungry to know that the power to really change the planet is right within them. And then, you know, you can bring them here for a visit if you choose to. <laughs> Finally, what I want to do is I want to share um, this amazing video with you. And I think it, you can use it as a talking point. What do you think about what this person is saying? Our own Courtney Poole, mwah, 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 <laughs> created this video. Um, and I think you'll applaud tremendously afterwards. She said she was inspired by my words, and now I'm inspired by her creation to get the message out into the world. I'm holding the knowing that this video is going to go positively viral. Positively viral, right? And you have a piece in this. So what about us humans? Are we finally ready to just say Humanity is one. Can we just start there? Are we willing to release the lie that says division and separation are required for a society to be successful? So I'm going to go there. My friends, there is no religion that is right. What? There is no religion that is right. Religion is a man-made construct. A man-made construct by men who attempted to create God in their image. I'm also going to go here. There is no political right party. There is no political right party. We go at war over this crazy concept. Once again, a construct. I'm going here too. There is no race that is right either. There is no race. There is only humanity. And the time, my friends, is now. It's time to stand up. It's time to create anew. It's time for us to be in the question of what society says is normal. It's not normal to hate someone simply because they look different than you. And these concepts, my friend, are all antithesis of truth. God is love and wants you to remember that you are part of it. And therefore, you are love.
Standing ovation, my friend, standing ovation. Well done, well done. You, you have a part in this. You see, you think the minister does it all? No, we can't. It's impossible. But it's a ripple effect that happens, right? Courtney created that amazing thing. What are we going to do with it? Are we just going to sit here and go, oh, well, that was nice. Or are we going to spread it, get the word out? This is not about my ego. I don't need for this to go viral. I'm clear in what spirit is calling me to do. But are you committed to changing the planet? Let's start, let's start, let's start. Get this word out. And I'm suggesting we get a new tagline for unity. The world is only love and oneness. Thank you. <laughs>